Let me finish these computations first. Obviously, we have to combine these two, they are all L related. Therefore, what I have is twice L times L plus 1. These are common, therefore I have multiplied with that, minus L, divided by twice L, L plus a half, L plus 1. Or, what do I have there? A, notice that if I factor 2, okay. There are several ways. I'm sure you may find your own way nicer than this. I prefer to write it as such. So put that L here, and there is 2L plus 1. 2L plus 1 times L plus 1. So that you can see the cancellations nicely. And up, you have 2L plus 1, 2L plus 1 cancels. All of a sudden, it beautifully reduces this to this simple expression. You know, you don't expect to get that such to get such simple expressions, but you do. So the first result is the j equals l plus a half case is en zero alpha squared over n times one over l plus one. Sorry, minus of course three over four, and that's always there, right? because I have dealt with the angular momentum part and the end part is there. Let's see whether we can get a similar uh, simplification in here. Again, the things to combine is these two. Let's do the same kind of simple arithmetics. In the numerator, I have twice L times L plus one coming from there because these are common. L plus a halves are common in the denominator. So I have plus L plus 1. I hope I haven't made any sign mistake, okay. Yes, plus L plus 1 was already there. So here 2L, or if you want, instead of writing as 2L, L times 2L plus 1 is a much better way of writing this. L plus 1. And in the numerator, I have, if you take the L plus 1 factor, you have L plus 1 times 2L plus 1 divided by twice, sorry, L times L plus 1 times 2L plus 1. Miraculously, again, the result is 1 over L. Incredible simplification all of a sudden. So this result is en0 alpha squared over n times 1 over l. Of course, minus, I'm really sorry. That's there. That's always there. So these two are the l equals l, uh, J equals L plus a half and J equals L minus a half results. Are these the same? Let me try to convert them into J. Here this corresponds to J equals L plus a half. Therefore, if I solve for L plus a half, what is L plus 1? Sorry, L. I have to add 1 plus a half to the right, a half to the right, left. So that's really equal to J plus a half, right? So if I now substitute this in, I have EN0 alpha squared over N, 1 over J plus a half minus 3 quarters times 1 over N. So the upper result becomes to this, equal to that one. Similarly, here j equals l minus a half. So what is l? 
It is j plus a half. Amazing. Indeed amazing. Sometimes there are these beautiful things happening in physics, right? 1 over j plus a half minus 3 quarters. And the same result. Well, is this a simple mathematical trick or a meaningful thing that I'm doing? Well, obviously I'm doing something meaningful because what is conserved is the total angular momentum. So a meaningful quantum number is the total angular momentum, right? A meaningful quantum number is the total angular momentum. Therefore, it makes sense to express the result in terms of the total angular momentum quantum number. That's what I have done. This is the L different than zero case. Let me turn my attention to L equals zero case and let's see whether that miracle is happening in here as well. This was the result that we had. Namely, this was the L equals zero result, right, that we had for the, this is delta E1. And so, so sorry, this was delta E1 only. This is the L equals zero for the entire thing. What I'm going to do next is the following. Here, L equals zero. If L is equal to zero, what is J? J is equal to S, which is one half, right? What is the j plus a half? One half plus one half is one. So what is the one over j plus a half? Is one over one, which is one. So this thing is one over j plus a half. That's beautiful, isn't it? So altogether what we see is our net result for all L is equal to this result. So I can write the total result now. The net total result independent of the possible different values of the L. Thus, net result. So, two first order the energy is EN0 plus delta EN. This is the entire delta EN. So let me write the result now. Two first order means the original term plus the corrections. That is the new corrected energy eigenvalue of the full eigenvalue equation, full Hamiltonian. So this is EN0, the leading term, one, plus alpha squared over n, one over j plus a half, minus three over four n. It's indeed a beautiful expression, right? A beautiful expansion, perturbative expansion. <coughs> That's the leading order term. It is corrected by an additional piece so that when you factor the n zero, it, the series goes like one plus a small coupling constant, not a very quantum coupling constant. Alpha is the typical measure of the reflection of the quantumness. So you see alpha square order corrections and n for uh, n was the original n. Now obviously, the degeneracy is lifted somewhat 
And the final, the corrected energy carries that additional index too, so I have to complement that in here. I will use a different color, saying that this new index popped up. The original one was fully degenerate, labeled by a single N. Now the new one, corrected one, carries an additional index, obviously, which would distinguish between the sum of the states, originally degenerate. So what we have to do next, before turning our attention to another problem, is to deal with this a little bit and see, for instance, what we have for the ground state and the first excited state. Let's quickly see the explicit results following from that general formula. Now, as we have constructed the first order corrections to the Coulomb energy eigenvalues coming from those three corrections, let's illustrate this explicitly for a couple of levels. The simplest example is of course the ground state of the hydrogen atom. So these are the illustrations or the examples. The n equals 1 case is quite easy because it is the lowest, it carries the lowest degeneracy n equals 1 so the, the degeneracy is just 2. So let's write, write the general expression for this case. The first index is the n equals 1. So E1 0, 1 plus alpha squared, 1 over j plus a half. Notice that here there would be an n, so I write n equals 1. So I'm just carrying over the formula to the n equals 1 case. And here is 4 times n, n equals 1. So substitution is writing n equals 1. So if we carry out the simple algebra, this reduces to a, a rather simple form, but for that, we have to remember that when n equals 1, n equals 0, because l runs from 0 to n minus 1, which is 0, when l equals 0, j equals l plus s becomes from, okay, j runs from l minus s to L plus a hand, L plus S, when L is equal to zero, J equals S, which is one half. That immediately simplifies this coefficient to one half plus one half one. So it is one minus three quarters. Therefore, E one J becomes, now I can put the J equals one half value explicitly, E one zero, one plus alpha squared, times 1 minus 3 quarters, so it is a quarter, so the result simply becomes alpha squared over 4. So that was easy, obviously, because particularly the addition of angular momentum part was easy if L equals 0 set to J equals S, but let's go to a slightly more <coughs> advanced example. That's the first example and that's the second example. <clears throat> n equals 2 case. So we again rewrite the expression as E2j is equal to, well, I'm not using approximation sign, perhaps I should, because this is the first order perturbative correction, not an exact expression. So E20, 1 plus, now alpha squared over 2, because there was n in here, we say replace n by 2, times 1 over j plus a half time minus 3 quarters of 1 over n. n is 2, so it is 3 by 8 is the first step. Let's run the addition of angular moment apart. So what are the possible values of L when n equals 2? L runs from 0 to 1, because 2, one min two one minus 1 is 1. So we have to now analyze the possible values of the j. For the L equals 0 case, J is equal to S automatically, which is 1 half. But for L equals 1, what are the possible values of the J? 
it is L minus S, which is one half, L plus S, which is three halves. So the possible values of J is one half and three halves. So it's quite crowded now. There are several values of the J. Well, I'm computing the J because the essential label in here, in addition to N, is the J. So what we have to do next is compute those things. Notice that there are two possible values of J. One half. One is coming from the L equals zero, the other coming from the L equals one. That's from the S wave and P wave. However, they combine to give you J equals one half. The other is J equals three half. So if you compute now the corresponding, well, perhaps I should write it underneath. If I now write the corresponding values, N equals two, obviously, and let's put the J indices accordingly. One half is, now I have to go back to this and simplify. When J equals one half, J plus a half is one, so this is one minus three eighths. One minus three eighths is five by eighths. There's a factor of one half, so five by 16, right? Let me repeat. This is one minus three, five by eight, so five by 16, indeed. So this becomes E two zero times one plus five by 16 alpha squared. Quite nice. Let's repeat the same for the J equals three halves. E two three halves is equal to E two zero times. Again, let's carry this analysis quickly by, by heart. When J equals, equal, J equals three halves, this, the denominator is two. It is a half minus three eighths. So four minus eight, four minus three by eight, which is one eight, so one over 16. One plus one over 16 alpha squared is the final result. Perhaps at this point it is, it may be good to count the degeneracies. J equals one half coming from this portion. How many possible states associated with this? Two J plus one is one. To one plus one. There are two states coming from here. Similarly, two states coming from here and here. Two times three half plus one is four. So there are, <coughs> although they come, they stem from different origins. That's S wave and P wave. There are two plus two, four states associated with this energy, and four states associated with this energy. So if I plot now the energy diagram in reflecting this onto, into a diagram. So the starting point, well of course the lowest is E10 here and the E20 here starts with before turning on the perturbative terms. Well, we forget the E10, that's done. It's so simple that I don't have to dwell on it any further. But for the E20, notice that there's a shift. Well, this is a positive definite quantity. E20 is minus, so the shifts are always to the lower level. So this is the original level going through. And so there is a, perhaps I should exaggerate this picture and to fit everything into the same level here. The first one is this shift from E20, which is associated with the E2 three halves. And the second one is E2 one half. That is, J equals one half or shifted more. This is obviously an exaggerated picture, not in real scale. And this is uh, the three halves is shifted less. There are four states associated with this level, four states associated with this level, although the original degeneracy was eightfold degeneracy. Two times n squared is eight. So it's partially lifted, but there are still fourfold degenerate E2 three halves level and fourfold degenerate E2 one half level. So I think that is essentially it as far as the pictures are concerned. And I think 
I should ask the class to continue and construct those states associated with those new level. Construction of the states associated with the E2 one half and E2 three halves. That could be a very good educative example because we compute the corrections to the energy levels to first order and perturbation theory and then the states to zeroth order perturbation theory and in this game we remember that at the zeroth order uh, due to the perturbations there is going to be a mixture of the original states. What were the original states for these eight ones? Well, one has to work out those eight and one. Then you'll see that the states will be a mixture of the original zero, original states associated with the Coulomb Hamiltonian only. So I will stop this example in here. So that completes our discussion on the real hydrogen atom due to those hyperfine correction terms. Eventually, when we discuss the Dirac equation, we, see, we will see how those terms naturally stem from the Dirac equation in the presence of an external Coulomb problem, but we postpone it till the Dirac case. Next, I start a new subject, new, a new issue, which is quite important, and that will keep us busy for quite some time particularly when we move into time-dependent problems. But the, let's start with the general case. That is the title of the new subject is Quantum Pictures. Well, quantum pictures are interesting in its own right, and so is sometimes people get confused about the name pictures, of course. These are not photographs or anything. These are different schemes of description <clears throat> of the quantum phenomena. And one might, one might wonder why we need different types of representations for the same physical problems. Obviously, whichever pictures or representation we use, we should come up always with the same answers, same descriptions. If we have different answers for the same physical problem, obviously, what we do is wrong. Therefore, the use of pictures is just for, is the, due to the need of convenience or simplicity and nothing else, because the results should come out always to be the same. When we talk about such in this context, obviously, the first picture is the default picture, which is the Schrodinger one. Picture. It is the default picture. Well, this means that we have constructed our quantum theory till now based on that, uh, that approach. Here, there is the physical states are represented by abstract vectors in the Hilbert space, which is an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And perhaps I should make that it's, it, it evolves in time. And time evolution problem, which, which we will discuss in detail, the actual case in detail later, time evolution is dictated by the uh, first degree differential equation in time. Here H is the Hamiltonian operator. So when we solve this equation, we know how the state evolves in time under the influence of this dynamical quantity called the Hamiltonian. <coughs> and uh, the, what is the physical interpretation of this? Well, it must be normalized in order to attribute to it a probabilistic interpretation. So this is an important physical restriction, psi t, and psi t is one. And perhaps before moving to descriptions of different pictures, we have to, uh, we have to establish a contact with the conventional notation, which is the Schrodinger theory of wave mechanics. 
Well, there, as, we, I, as I have repeatedly mentioned before, there the states are represented by this wave function. And of course, there's a similar equation which everyone knows because this is the conventional language which is used in all fields of for velocity non-independent potentials at least we have this conventional picture psi of xt and what is the relationship between this abstract Hilbert space vector and these wave functions well, before establishing that, we have to remember that the, the Copenhagen interpretation requires that psi mod squared is the probability density, that is the, num the probability of finding an object somewhere in the universe in a unit volume at a given time. T is given by this. And the total probability is obtained by integrating this, because integration is the summation, because these are continuous functions infinite dimensional function, square integrable. Well, first of all, this should be one. Well, being one means that the sum over all options, if this is the probability theory, should be one, which is consistent with the basic axioms of the probability theory. And this one is positive, obviously, right? And this also consistent with the second axiom of the probability theory. These are simple things we all know quite well, okay? Well, what is the relationship then, this wave function and the state vector? Well, I have, as I said, I have repeatedly mentioned in the past that this is an abstract Hilbert space vector and we can represent it in any basis we like. And one of the ideal bases is the basis constructed by the eigenvectors of the position operator, which is d cube x, x, x and psi t. And this one is the so-called wave function of Schrodinger. And notice that this really follows the usual, this childish example, that is the i, the basis vector, and the coordinates. Therefore, this is the vector, and that's the summation associated with that summation. These are the basis vectors. That's the abstract vector. This is the basis vectors, and these are the coordinates. So Schrodinger wave function is nothing but the coordinates in the position operator bases. Well, so this is everything we know about this default picture, and there all the observables are observables are time independent, including the Hamiltonian itself. And the state function, state vector or function, carries all the time dependence. Well, there will be specific problems in physics which forces us to consider a different approach. That is, can we imagine a new picture in which observables carry the time dependence and state vectors or state wave functions are frozen in time? Well, this was possible and it was first discovered by, the, by Heisenberg, one of the great founders of the quantum theory. So let me move into Heisenberg picture. It is a beautiful one and it's a quite a simple picture really when you come to think of it. So Heisenberg picture is defined <coughs> through a unitary transformation. That is we take <coughs> the entities from the Schrodinger picture and A, let's A represent the observables. These are the entities we have in our Hilbert space. And these are the Schrodinger ones. Therefore, I have to really correct my notation. States carry time dependence. Observables are frozen in time if these are Schrodinger picture entities. So what are the transformations? The transformation should be unitary. Why? We want the norms to be preserved. That is, if we have a Hilbert Schrodinger picture states which are normalized, if we move to the other one, we want to ensure that states stay normalized because normalization is a very physical property. Therefore, we have to carry out a unitary transformation. <laughs> 
Well, there are two approaches really. Either we say, let's not specify explicitly what that unitary transformation is, but keep it unknown yet. Go, carry the transformation from the Schrodinger one. For the sake of explicitness, let's put the S index for the Schrodinger entities. Eventually we will drop it because we know that default picture doesn't carry any index. There is no need to describe it, but suppose we do that. Heisenberg one will carry an index H, U, Psi, T, S, and the A, S, as I have described before, that the operators transform in a certain way as if, the specific, if it is specified for the states. Then we go to A, H, U, A, Schrodinger, U, inverse. Then we require that these new states are frozen in time. They don't, they, they don't depend on time explicitly. Then it gives us, from here, through this requirement, u is equal to e to the i over h bar, h and t. Well, obviously it is unitary as indicated before. h is her mission, therefore u is unitary, thanks to the fact that there is an operator r. There is a number i appearing there. Well, I don't want to follow that approach, it is, although it's more direct. The other approach, which is more pedantic, is to use this known result and carry out the transformations and indeed demonstrate that new size do not depend on time and A, A, the new A's carry a time dependence. Let's demonstrate that. If U's are given as such, then psi <coughs> T H is e to the I over H bar H T psi T of Schrodinger. That's the definition. And let's <coughs> see, let's check the time dependence. D by DT psi T of H. Is D by DT acting on the both of the terms. The first term gives us i over h bar h times the operator itself. And second one is i over h bar h t psi t, sorry, d by dt psi t Schrodinger. What we have to do is go to the default picture and check what that equation is. It was one of the, in some sense, one of the basic axioms. It is one over i h bar h on psi of t Schrodinger, right? Well, notice that here there is this product appearing in both terms. The, but they are in the different positions. Com one is in the left, one is in the right. However, this is no problem because we know that operators commute with any function of themselves. That's the general theorem which you can prove by expanding that function into Taylor series. Therefore, when i comes up at minus i over h bar plus i over h bar, you get zero. So indeed, the states are frozen in time. They do not evolve. They are fixed. Well, obviously, it's already immediate from this that somehow this time dependence should be transferred to the observables. So that time de if time dependence is eliminated, erased altogether, we are in trouble because it means dynamics is lost. So how do we, evo well, let's first of all check the time dependence of the observables to get a little bit relaxed because this is rather strange if the other option materialized, up, thanks God, it won't, of course. So let's check the time dependence of the new AH, which using that definition, d by dt e to the i over h bar ht a Schrodinger e to the minus i over h bar ht. Well, if you run the derivative, it should run on, it should act on both, on the three of them. But these are 
by default time independent, therefore it will not act on the Schrodinger picture observables, they do not depend on time. If the it acts on the first one, it brings down i over h bar times h, put in the left. This acts on the last factor, again brings down i over h bar h with a minus sign, put the h to the right. Then what you get? i over h bar h e to the i over h bar h t. I write it in, in length, although it may sound to some of you as stupid, indeed it may. This is a h. So I obtained this beautiful equation. d by dt a h is i over h bar commutator of h with a h. Nice. So indeed this is a dynamical equation and we should solve this equation to explicitly determine the time dependence of the a. State, states stay the same, a devel develop in time. Let's demonstrate that this indeed is a good alternative. That is, whatever we can do in the Schrodinger picture can be carried, can be done, can be achieved in this new picture. What does it mean? It means the answers to all kind of physical questions we, that we can come up with in the Schrodinger picture can be similarly obtained in this new picture, or else we would be in trouble, of course. We want the, the same, all the physical questions to be answered in a similar manner to, to lead to the same, exactly the same result. But before really working out these, let's, uh, work, let's observe several features in this new picture. Some properties. The properties are the following. Well, the first one is a trivial one, which should be, otherwise uh, all these would be total nonsense. The expectation values of the observables in this new picture, which I denote as such, put an H down here, meaning psi in the H, A in the H, psi in the H, should be the same as psi in the Schr sorry, A in the Schrodinger picture, which can immediately be proven by putting the definition and the, the definition in here, that is psi Schrodinger u inverse u a Schrodinger u inverse and for this this is the middle quantity that's the first quantity and u psi Schrodinger then you neighboring u's are cancelled and we indeed demonstrate the equality proven fine that's beautiful second the states in at t equals zero are the same. Psi t equals zero Heisenberg is the same as psi t Schrodinger. Well, perhaps this is a rather senseless way of writing. Psi Heisenberg, because it doesn't depend on time, is the same as psi t equals zero of the Schrodinger. Meaning, these two pictures merge at t equals zero. Obviously, it is obvious from the better definition. Third, Hamiltonian, this is a bit strange. It's the same in both pictures. Well, obviously, this is, as I said, a trivial statement. There's, it's sort of childish that I have to mention this, but I have to mention it yet. So if we go to the definition of the observables, if I take AH the Hamiltonian now, what we get? Hamiltonian in the Heisenberg picture is e to the i over h bar. Well, obviously, as we start from the Schrodinger picture to start with, so it is the unitary operator should contain the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger picture. As I said, I'm not using the indices for the Schrodinger picture entities because it's default. However, let's do it for the clarity. So this is really that, the definition of the Hamiltonian in the Schrodinger picture is that. Operators commute with any functions of themselves, so you move this out. These are inverse operators killing each other. 
So therefore, there is no need for using any label for the Hamiltonian. We have to erase all the indices. Hamiltonian means it is a sort of central quantity, which is the same in all pictures. Eventually, when we go to interaction pictures, the situation will change a little bit, but this is it. Well, as Hamiltonian is independent, to start with, it is independent of time in the Heisenberg picture as well. So it's a bit strange. For H, again, funny, which is equal to Hs, is independent of the time. Well, this is, to emphasize it, I write it. Or more, it's obvious from that expression, but I still write it. Independent of the time in the Heisenberg picture as well. All the observables depend on time except the Hamiltonian. So it means you can choose, you can take the time Hamiltonian to be at any time you like. Time independent, so it's going to have the same value. You can choose it at any time you like. Why did I go through that example? I went through that example because if we write this, rewrite this equation now, putting in the time dependencies explicitly, in order to compute that commutation relation and construct the time, time dependence of the A observables as time evolves, I will need to know at what time H should be. I'm free to choose the time the way I like, so I choose the time of H to be the same as the T. Why do I need that? That's an important question. That's the fifth property. I claim that commutators at equal time commutators of observables, let's say, of observables at equal time transform like the observables themselves. That's a very important property. Although it may sound a bit trivial, it is trivial, but it's a very powerful observation. So let's demonstrate that. If I take the commutators at different times, they are really complicated and carry no meaning. It is the commutators at equal time which carry physical meaning because of this particular property, really. So let's demonstrate the theorem which I have written in plain English. Let's consider two observables, AT and BT. Let's see what this commutator is equal to in terms of the commutators in the Schrodinger picture. Now let me use the shorthand. U A Schrodinger U inverse is the first one. U B Schrodinger U inverse is the second one. So if I write this commutator immediately, you see that this times that, these are cancelled, or this times that, these cancel. So indeed I have U, A Schrodinger, B Schrodinger, U inverse, exactly the same way. So what are the consequences of this? The consequences of this general theorem, which is a beautifully powerful theorem, is first XT, PT, I suppress the indices H's, if you want you can put them in, is equal to U, X and P, U inverse. Let's put the indices I and J, not, not to make it look trivial, because without in the one dimension, they may look uh, trivial. Well, this is I H bar delta H, the usual Heisenberg algebra of the basic entities, so it becomes this is times an identity in here, so it indeed becomes I H bar delta I J. So it is, this powerful theorem is was required that we needed to prove it just to demonstrate that these equal time commutators still have the same meaning as in the Schrodinger picture. And second one is X I T Heisenberg, X J Heisenberg is equal to U x i x j u inverse this is zero so this is zero 
And similarly, 3 pi h t p j h t is equal to u at p i p j u inverse. This is zero, so that's zero. So you see, we, we have reproduced the Heisenberg algebra among the basic operators x and p for the equal time commutators. If we, were, if we had to check this for the non-equal time commutators, it would be total nonsense. It would carry no physical or mathematical meaning. So we, now in a, we are in a position to use this to address several problems. The first example could be this free particle problem. And second, a more involved problem will be the harmonic oscillator. And all these examples will be carried out in the recitation hours by my teaching assistant. So this completes my discussion of the Heisenberg picture. And next subject, which is sort of a continuation of this, will be the so-called interaction picture, which we'll pick up next.